Throne Wars is the title of today's message. Actually, it's part three of Throne Wars. We've been looking at this text uh, and going through it verse by verse. Today, we'll be focusing on verse 15. Uh, verse 15 reads, You also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Uh, let me ask you the same question that I've been asking you for the past two weeks. Who sits on the throne of your heart? Who sits on the throne of your heart? Let me put it a different way. When the word of God contradicts your lifestyle, what do you do? When the word of God confronts you about a lifestyle that you're living, what do you do about it? Do you conform your lifestyle to the word of God? Or do you compromise the word of God to fit your fleshly desires? Simply put, do you conform to the truth of God's word or do you compromise the word of God to fit your lifestyle? And if you conform to the word of God, that means Jesus is sitting on the throne of your heart. Can I get an amen? But if you compromise the word of God, that means Jesus is not on your heart throne. You're actually inviting Satan because Satan always is rebellious against the truth of God's word. Satan always questions God word, God's word. Did God really say? Oh, he didn't mean it that way. When you read the word of God, he'll always try to rationalize you. Rationalize you. And we'll try to turn you around to compromise the word of God rather than conform and obey the truth of God's word. That can be one barometer of seeing where our hearts are. Does Jesus sit on the throne of my heart or have we invited Satan? And I've told you that Satan, he doesn't have his presence on the throne. Rather, he's going, to, he's going to invite you to sit on the throne of your heart. And he's going to be the puppet master. And he's going to say, you deserve this. Oh, you need this. You want this. More of this. More of the flesh. Fill up your stomach. Fill up your mind with frivolous things. It's okay to waste time. There's going to be another day coming. Really? We don't know when the world is going to end. We don't know when Jesus is coming. We're praying, come Jesus soon. Come Lord, we need you. We, I, I long for you, Jesus, to come. And yet, the devil always says, there's going to be another day. He hasn't come for 2,000 years. So maybe there's going to be another 2,000. Who knows? Only God, only the Father knows. Today we come to a very pivotal point in the church in Pergamum because this is another correction, another directive Jesus is directly giving to the church. There are those who follow the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Everyone say Nicolaitans. There was a teaching back in the early church that some people thought came from one of the deacons that was chosen from Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6. One of the deacons that were chosen was a, a person named Nicholas. And some church fathers have written uh, various notes on Nicholas, who eventually, they presume, became the leader who went away from the true gospel. This is intriguing to me because those who are Positioned in leadership can also lead people astray. But didn't Jesus already warn us about that in his word? That there are going to be many false prophets. Wolves in what clothing? Sheep's clothing. So on the outside there, ba, 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 I'm so ba, ba, humble. I'm so ba, ba, filled with the spirit. And yet they're not filled with the spirit of God. They're filled with the spirit of pride, filled with the spirit of self-acclamation, filled with self. And do you know how wolves 
catch their prey. It's quite interesting if you observe nature, and I love observing nature, by, by the way. I just sometimes sit in my backyard, and I look up at the trees, and the trees are singing God's praise as the wind is blowing. I see the birds praising God. I see the grass praising God, and I'm praising God, and we're just worshiping in my backyard. And this week, I learned about how wolves attack and catch their prey. Usually, they work in a pack. They work in groups. So worry, be worried about those who are wolves in sheep clothing, and they like to do things in groups. But how they do it is this. They are very good at running long distance. So they will follow a pack that they're trying to get, and then as they're running after, they're running away, they follow, they run away, they follow, they run away, and as they run away, one of the sheep, who might be the weakest of the flock, guess what? They can't run anymore. So one of the sheep gets left behind, and that's the prey that the wolves attack. Some of us are running the race good right now. <laughs> running the race. Yeah, I'm good. I'm keep, I'm just, I can keep going and going. But what happens when your steam runs out? What happens when our passions run out? Then inevitably, there's only two ways to go about it. You either get filled up with the spirit of the living God and is an anointing, and you keep on running the race, amen? Or you fall behind and become isolated and detached from the pack, the church, the community of faith. You become isolated. Well, I can worship God anywhere, so Sunday morning is not very important. I'm just going to go to the mountains and do my own thing. It sounds good, but then when you are away from the pack, you get isolated. And, and then all of these ideas about, why is nobody calling me from the church? I have not been there for a week and nobody misses me. Well, I'm going to try them one more time. I'll miss one more Sunday, right? So I'm just going to go to the seaside now. I'm just going to do my own thing here. And eventually, your heart grows cold because how far can you run by yourself? Not very far. I remember training to become an officer in the Air Force in Korea. And at the beginning of my training, my running was very poor. Couldn't run very far. But every morning... My drill sergeant would come, very kindly and loudly, speak into my ears, get right up, and we would run in a formation, left, right, left, right. Anybody, anybody understand that? Anybody? Yes, praise the Lord. Thank you for your service, friends. Praise God. But as we ran as a group, we could run longer and, and further. That's the church community that God has designed for you and for me and the church in Pergamum. And yet... Jesus finds that they are following the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And you might be wondering, well, what are the teachings of the Nicolaitans? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us about the teachings of the Nicolaitans, but it gives us clues. Just look with me in the same chapter of Revelation 2. Revelation 2, he writes to the church in Ephesus and in verse 6, we read this, to the church in Ephesus, this is Jesus speaking. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We receive a clue that Jesus hates the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Some of you are thinking, but Jesus loves everybody. How can he hate something? That's right. That's very good. The teachings of the Nicolaitans were leading the church people away from Jesus. Anything and everything that makes you go astray from Jesus, Jesus says, I don't want that. I hate that. Why? Because he loves you. You've you got to open your spiritual ears and your spiritual hearts today. Remember, God is a God of the covenant. He loves you, and his church is the bride. Amen? 
Who's our bridegroom king? Jesus. He loves us, and his, his, his love for us is so great that he, he is a jealous God. Because if I see my wife, and this will probably never happen, but if I see my wife having dinner with another man, guess what's going to happen to me? I will walk right in. Excuse me? Uh, what, what's going on? <laughs> see, I, I didn't get the memo. You're in my seat, sir. You're in my seat. This is my bride. Praise God. Love requires us to be so focused on that relationship that anything that hinders us from getting our eyes off of our true love, we will say no. No in Jesus' name. Vice versa, if I, this should never happen, I have my code of conduct I, I, I never sit one-on-one -on -one with, with the opposite sex. But let's just hypothetically, if I'm sitting and having dinner with somebody else, a, a, a lady, then I expect my wife to come in, and she, she's a black belt in Taekwondo. <laughs> and I expect her... <laughs> I won't go further. She's very loving and gentle. That's love. True love, pure love looks like this. And when Jesus says, I hate the teachings, this means that they have gone, veered off from the true teachings of Jesus. And ch the church fathers like Irenaeus and Clement of Alexandria and Hippolytus, they, they wrote some about uh, Nicholas and the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And one of them, they, they write this. They add, Nicholas departed from sound doctrine and was in the habit of inculcating indifferency both life and food. Meaning that Nicholas taught Gnostic beliefs. What is that? Well, it's the irre irrelevance of physical things. Now, let me explain to you. Gnostic ways of thinking is this. My soul is saved. So whatever I do with the flesh, it doesn't matter at all. If you hear that kind of teaching, you say no in Jesus' name. That's the teaching of the Gnostics that we say no to. Amen? I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to get this into your minds. Say no. Because when God saves, he sanctifies and then he glorifies. It is not just a salvation of the soul. He wants to sanctify us fully. Entirely sanctify us. And that includes our bodies, friends. Hallelujah. We take care of our bodies. Why? The Bible teaches us. Don't you know that your bodies are the temple where the spirit of the living God lives? And so what we do with our bodies, it matters to God because he wants to sanctify us. We don't live just to eat and have our fill. We don't just to live to get drunk on wine. No, quite the opposite. Paul says, do not get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. This is how it looks. You're anointed with the Holy Ghost. You walk with him. You live in the center of his will, and you accept God's peace, his joy, and his power. You receive revelation from above. You see things differently, but because you don't see from a human perspective, you see from a godly perspective. God has a plan. Nothing will faze me. Nothing will faze me. Why? God loves me. And I want to stay true to him. So the teachings of the Nicolaitans, it started with people uh, trying to say, well, we're not going to eat this kind of food or eat that kind of food or do this kind of thing, to it changed. It changed from an ascetic philosophy where you say no to everything to a licentious philosophy where you accept everything. Whatever we do with the body, it is fine. And I've tried to think about ways to help you understand what the teachings of the Nicolaitans can be. Basically, it is. It's this. It's a life of compromise. A life of compromise. Because you know the truth, and something else comes in, and you're like, you know what? I think it'd be nice to mix that in. 
And it becomes not the pure gospel, it becomes a hodgepodge gospel of your definition of what the Word of God says. Your definition doesn't matter. God's definition matters. God's Word. His Word spoken, breathed by the Spirit of the living God. This is what matters. And I'm not trying to be mean to you, but it's the truth. Because if the Word of God is so divided into so many opinions, what's the truth? Well, people say, well, we live in this age, pastor. Everything is just relevant. What is true for you is true for you. What is true for me is true for me. So let's just be friends. To that I say, well, I believe in the absolute truth. The absolute truth of God's word tells me that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. That is the truth. I can't veer off from the truth. I didn't write it. God told us. Through his son Jesus and his word is spirit and therefore there's life in that spirit. So we accept it and embrace it. Yes, Lord, that's true. And I'm not going to veer from the truth. It's like the first love that Jesus talks about. When you first accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when you were so passionate to serve him and love him, why is that heart grown so cold? Perhaps because you, without even knowing, have been following the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Compromise. Compromise. No, just, just carve out that word from the Bible, Pastor, and then it's all going to be okay. Let's just be tolerant and inclusive. Now, I mentioned to you, I mean, five decades ago, something that was bad and dark now has become good and righteous. And I believe that's going to accelerate because now it's not about tolerance. It's not about inclusiveness. Now they want us to celebrate sin. To that we say, no. We do not condone sin. Praise God. Why? Jesus paid the price. So why would we want to condone sin? No, we want to live in the path of righteousness because my Savior has walked that path. He lived a sinless life. And so we follow in his footsteps, the narrow way, the narrow gate. I follow him. And sometimes the, the way of a Christian is such that you, you need to be so laser focused because if you sway to the left or to the right, guess what? The enemy is right there to snatch you and say, see, it's more comfortable not going to church and worshiping God. It's more comfortable just to watch online and live stream everything. It's just more comfortable, right, to, to not open up your Bible and read it on your Bible apps. By the way, I have a Bible app too. Nothing wrong with that. But sometimes when you're reading the Bible app, bing, notification from your friend. So do you have the self-control to just swipe that away and keep on reading, or do you click on that and keep going back? See, some people have that faith and self-control. God bless you. My mind gets so distracted by the pings, I just need to lay that down and open my old-fashioned, good old Bible. Don't you love hearing the... Don't you love the smell of your Bible? Oh, thank you, Jesus. This is, this is fresh bread. Fresh bread from above. Speak to me, Lord. Let the word read me like an x-ray. This, this past week, I was at the doctor's getting uh, some x-ray for my shoulder. I think I injured it playing tennis. Now, the one who injures themselves playing a sport means that they're pretty old to play that sport. <laughs> Just my philosophy. Anyways, so they're taking my x-ray. They can actually see what's inside of me through the x-ray. If medical devices can see through me, then what about the eyes of God reading me? telling me who I am. And if there's anything on my face that's dirty, the word of God is like a mirror. And I look at, oh my goodness, why did I have this? I mean, haven't you ever had discussions and you, you were meeting with somebody and then you go home and realize you've had this booger up your nose all that time? Anybody? And you're like, why didn't you tell me? Just tell me to blow my nose. 
By the way, I, I do that nowadays. So if I tell you to blow your nose, I'm being nice to you and being loving and kind. Yeah. <laughs> there was once uh, my, my previous pastor, right? Uh, I, he was greeting people, and I saw that his flies were down. Do you know what I did? I kidnapped him. I hugged him, and I said, okay, we're going to the toilet now. <laughs> Why? Because I didn't want him to be embarrassed. So I kidnapped him. Like, and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, Just, you'll know when we get in there. <laughs> Your zip is down. That's love, though, because you love that person. You're able to come near and say things that are true. Well, if I say this, are they going to not like me anymore? No. They're going to be eternally embarrassed about that booger that was up their nose. See, the word of God is such that it gives us truth. Truth. And when the truth is illuminated in our hearts, guess what happens? There is freedom. There is joy. There is peace. But the Nicolaitans and the teachings of the Nicolaitans were such that it was leading people astray. Don't we face those things today? Even preachers, and I believe some of them are wolves with sheep clothing, saying to you, it's okay. Do whatever you want. It's okay. It's just if you've given your heart to Jesus, you're good. You're saved. How detrimental is that to the soul? I'd rather be under a preacher who may not have eloquent words, but preach the truth. And by God's grace, God is affording us the joy and the privilege to hear God's word because God does not want us to compromise our faith. Another teaching of the Nicolaitans, and I'm just going to explain it in a different way, is this, that you have your own version of the gospel. What is the gospel? What is the good news? The good news is this, we are sinners, and we need a Savior. And Jesus came down from above, and he laid down his life on the cross for our sins, and those who would come to him by faith, his grace and forgiveness washes us from all sins and makes us into a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. But if you add anything, Jesus plus this, well, you can accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you need to run 10,000 laps uh, at Danvers High School. That is not the gospel. But some of us want to do something and do something that is called works righteousness. It's like, I, I need to do something. God, I, I appreciate you sending your son to die for me on the cross, but I feel like I need to contribute something. So do you think I could do some more laps? Do you think I could do some more push-ups just to make you feel a little... Can I contribute? No, God, does, God doesn't need our contribution. We're sinful. He is holy. And therefore, we come in with humility and receive that grace that flows from the broken body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. There is no works righteousness. It is a salvation by grace. But a person that is saved by grace will work out their faith and it will show in righteous, pure, holy acts. And that relationship with God and with others will be developed. Some of you wonder, why doesn't anybody like me? Right? Right? Why doesn't anybody like me? Why don't they call me? It seems like my friend, they post something, they get 20 million likes, and I got two, my mom and my dad. Like, oh, woe is me. I only got two likes, they got two million. Right? Well, that's, that happens when you're all focused about self. Self, me, myself and I. What's more important is this. The redeemed people of God we live for his glory. Can I get an amen? amen? Not my glory. Nothing. I'm nothing. I have been crucified with Christ. It is I that no longer lives, but Christ lives in me. So when I die to myself on the cross with Jesus, guess what? I'm resurrected with the power of Christ. And so I live for his glory. So everything I do is, is geared toward how do I give God praise? How do I give God glory? 
How do I honor him with my first fruits of my time? How do I honor him with the first fruits of my earnings? How do I honor him with my first child? Nobody's saying amen here. You don't want to give up your child for the ministry of the Lord? Nobody? Well, if you don't want it, I'm going to take it. I'm going to receive that blessing. And I'm praying, Lord, use the first fruits as we lay them down on your altar. Jesus hates the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And by the way, this teaching is still going on today. There is compromise, there is lawlessness. And we hold on to things that ought not to have higher place in our hearts. Let me talk about money. Anybody heard Jesus talk about money? He talks a lot about money. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. Money will entice you. I mean, it's like money tries to lure you into, well, if you work harder, you'll get more money. But the harder you work, your body's going to break down. But money doesn't tell you about that, right? The demons lure you, say, Joe, just come, it's going to be good for you. You deserve this. It's like they make you buy things that you don't really need. It's like me walking into Costco. Uh, no offense to Costco, I'm a member. Uh, but I walk in and I call my wife, honey, I found things that we really never thought we needed, but it's on sale. There's like a million toothpicks for two dollars. And she's like, do we need two million toothpicks, honey? I mean, how many times a day are you going to pick your teeth? Thank you, honey, for talking some sense into me. I hang up the phone. But the devil is like, you got to have this. And then when you buy it, oh, it's only going to be like $50 a month. But once you have five products that you don't really need, that amasses to a crushing financial burden. The devil's like, gotcha. I got you. Because if I can get a hold of your finances... It's easy to get a hold of your heart. Money has that pull. Money in itself is not evil. But if you have the spirit of the living God, God will give you the wisdom to command money where to go. It's the same with your time. I'm always rushing. I'm busy, Pastor. I, I don't have time. No, but I, I'd love to have coffee. No, I'm so busy. I can't have coffee. Well, maybe we could just talk. Uh, no, no, I'm just so busy. Everyone's busy, right? But you have all the time to post on your social media, and you have all the time to do this. You have all the time to, because you make time for the things that you value, no? No, you don't. But if you value Jesus, you'll be so locked in. This is my prayer for myself. Lord, every minute, split second of the day, Lord, would you help me to be so fixed on Jesus? And to walk with him and to sing to him. He gives me revelation. And I lay hands on the sick and they be made well. I'm just quoting scripture. Just scripture. I see demons cast out in Jesus' name. Not because of me, because of him. I see people being restored. I see marriages being restored. I see families being restored. I see people jumping to a different career. God giving them God dreams, not my dreams being able to interpret prophecy and dreams in Jesus' name, walking in signs, miracles, and wonders. Praise God. Even this past week, your pastor got a call, being invited to preach in Malaysia. I'm praying about it. But who on earth knows me? No one. I'm a nobody. But somehow, God is bringing people to my sphere of influence. And do you know what I do? I always think about this. When I pray over here, I think about me just doing my rounds. And if I go round and round and round, there will be a hurricane of God's love, grace, and mercy. And that's going to continue to our congregation, continue to the North Shore, continue to the New England district, continue to the nations. Why not? We serve a wonderful Savior, and his word is true. And we also, as Jesus does, hate the teachings of the Nicolaitans. We don't follow it. We don't compromise. 
We don't follow the ways of lawlessness. We will stand true to the teaching of God's word. So what happens to the people who continue to follow the teaching of the Nicolaitans? It's quite simple. Verse 16, let's read. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The key here is God's loving embrace through his son Jesus telling us to repent. Turn from our wicked ways and turn back to him saying no to the ways of the Nicolaitans or the teachings of Balaam. Saying no to compromise, no to lawlessness, but saying yes to the order of God's truth, to his standard. But if you don't repent, there is a consequence. I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Who are the them in the text? The ones who will not repent. There are two kinds of people on this earth. One, they have embraced Jesus, filled with the Holy Ghost, and they walk in righteousness and purity, and they are sanctified every day. For those people, God's sword will fight on your behalf. And the God of angel armies will fight your battles. That is a blessed people. I don't have to fight my own battles. I got no power. I got a bad shoulder. Praise Lord. Heal me, heal me, Lord Jesus. Amen. I believe it. I believe. It. But I can't fight the spiritual battles with my physical. So I pray in the spiritual. And the Lord of hosts, he fights on my behalf. And my God has never lost a battle. My God is always victorious. But take that thought of him always being victorious and come to the other side of another group of people who will not repent, who will not conform to the word of God, but always compromise and live in the way that they just feel comfortable. These people are the people where God's sword is against them. It is a very scary place to be in. Why? I just told you, God never loses. So even if you try to fight God, guess what? You're going to lose. It's a done deal. And so the consequence of these people who will not repent is, is so severe that it should make you really like cringe and tremble at God's word. We need to tremble at God's word. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord oh, oh, oh sometimes it causes me to tremble 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 were you there when they crucified my Lord, when are we going to tremble at God's word and conform to his ways? Because in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, this is what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Compromise, <coughs> lawlessness, out of order inviting chaos, inviting evil spirits. And last week I talked to you about food sacrificed to idols, and in our day and context it can be this. You consuming the media that the enemy has made up for a certain agenda. You consume more of it, guess what? You get consumed by it. And it's 
permeating the whole canvas of this generation. Oh, we just have to be all so accepting and, and just loving. After all, love is love, right? No, God is love. Not an adulterated love. It is a pure love, agape love. And if we truly love that person, we will not just condone their sin. We'll speak the truth in love to them. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, Paul talks to the church in Corinth, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And it's becoming so... My heart breaks for the younger generation who have no idea what they're doing with their bodies. No idea. God loves you and has a purpose for your life. But you are just maiming it. You are just turning it into something that you weren't created to do. Lord, have mercy. Please, I plead with you. I plead with you. Embrace God's love. Yeah, but all my friends are doing it, so I just feel like I need to do it. Don't trust your feelings, friend. you got to have faith. Faith that will not falter through the storm. Yeah, but... I just feel pressure to do it. No, they won't even know you after 10 years, but the God of the universe knows you now and he has you in, your, in his embrace today. Receive him, accept him. Jesus loves you. Do you can you imagine that conversation? Have you prayed for somebody that's, that's agonizing in sin and they don't even know it and you fast and pray on their behalf? Lord, save them from their sexual immorality, Lord Jesus. They don't know what they're doing, Lord. Save them, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Some of you are like, but I've been praying for 20 years, 30 years, nothing's changed. No, keep on praying. Because your prayers will outlast your life, for we pray to an eternal God. Hallelujah. Even after I'm God, gone, God is able to fulfill his promises. Even after you're gone, the prayers that have been deposited to an eternal God, he will unfold in his right time. That's why we can't lose as a people of God. We stand victorious because he goes and fights our battles, not as those who won't repent and God fights against us. And we tremble at his word against all co compromise, against all lawlessness. What about 1 Corinthians 6 time? Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals. Listen to me, friends. Sin. It is sin. There is nothing else about it. It is against the will of God. But why do we say yes and say, well, we just compromise here and compromise there? Just a, a little little smidgen of sin here. I always ask you, anybody like to drink coffee? Anybody like to drink tea? Anybody? Anybody like to drink water? <laughs> Me? So inside your tea or coffee or water, let's say there's a, you know, just a little bit of um, dog poop. And, and it's all powdery because it's all big con condensed and uh, it's just flaky, right? Uh, just a, a smidgen of that in your coffee. How about that? Anybody? Makes you want to throw up? Praise the Lord. It should. It should. That's contamination by compromise. Coffee, tea, or water ought to have its own authentic taste. Amen? It ought not to be contaminated by a smidgen of dog poop or anything else. Nothing. Some of you, after hearing my message, you're all just going to remember dog poop in your coffee, right? <laughs> I just know it. I'm going to get any... Pastor, I was so blessed by your sermon this week. That dog poop analogy always gets me. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is our faith cannot be compromised. Jesus died on the cross. He rose again. Amen. That's it. He's the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. Don't follow any other teachings, whether it be from Balaam or the Nicolaitans. Don't get swayed, friends. And I'm going to tell you, if you walk this path, you're going to get persecuted. People are going to call you, oh, you're a homophobe. 
Oh, you're, you're just too narrow-minded. And when people say that to you for speaking the truth in love, do this. Hallelujah, Lord. I'm doing something right for the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the kingdom, for theirs is the kingdom. Amen? Because of Jesus. Don't get persecuted for your own stupidity. You deserve that. I deserve that. I do. But for Jesus, when you get persecuted, rejoice. Thank you, Lord. There are some people who, who love to comment on our videos. They're like, he's a heretic. He's gone overboard. Or they, they write all the... I'm like, thank you, Lord. We're doing something right. I get voicemail, and I've never even heard of these swear words before, but I, I just get a mouthful. I'm like, wow, you, that's, whoo, you need Jesus, right? And I say, Lord, I'm doing something right because the gospel is being preached. And Lord, help me not to compromise, never to compromise your gospel, even if it costs me my position here at the Danvers Church of the Nazarene. Now, I love our congregation, and I would never want to be removed. But if the preaching of God's word gets to that point where it offends so many people and you vote me out as your pastor for preaching the word of God, praise God. Debbie, at least there's one person that said no way. <laughs> God bless you, sister. That's very good timing. No way, pastor. But if that happens in this church, then I'd be very happy to remove myself, go down the street, get on a milk crate, and preach the gospel. Because this land needs Jesus. It is a dry, dry land. And I'm praying for the reign of God, for him to open wide the floodgates and rain down Jesus. And I'm expectant of that. And we give all the glory and praise to God because that does not come from me. It comes from him. So are we ready to repent today? Are we ready to come back to him today? Are we ready to say, Lord, I have compromised my faith. I have been believing in my own version of the gospel and I am so sorry. Would you accept my heart of confession and repentance and transform me today? Are you ready for that today? How many churches preach on repentance? How many churches preach on holiness unto the Lord? I don't care about other churches. Here it will be preached. We are a Christian church, a holiness church, and a missional church. God has called us to that. And we will continue to go in that direction and to invite Jesus on the throne of our hearts and not follow the teachings of Balaam or the Nicolaitans but follow Jesus to the T, not faltering. Some of you, when you first got your driver's license, all you knew how to do was to go straight, <laughs> holding onto your steering wheel. Just going straight. And you, you knew you missed your turn, but you're still going straight. As funny as that is, I believe we ought to be like that today, fixing our eyes on Jesus, following him. Don't need to look to the left nor to the right. Just fix your eyes on Jesus and your destination, heaven. And if you fix your eyes on Jesus, you have the faith to live heaven on earth right now. You live in the power. You have the presence. You know that God is for you. And when God is for you, nothing can stand against. So let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us pray.